Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. To everybody who's here today, I'm really happy that you're with us. I, I told you that because of the ministry of Lee Grady and Advent season beginning November 28th and a series kind of springboarding off that, that I was going to kind of do a standalone sermon the 1st of November. Uh, Reverend Lee Grady was going to come. How many of you enjoyed last week? Come on, I'm still, I'm still uh, excited about all that was done in my heart and life and in our church. But I really felt the leading of the Lord to kind of continue in this vein in the book of James. So it's a standalone sermon, but it, it connects in a way to a couple weeks back. So if you haven't seen that sermon, just go on our YouTube or our website uh, page and you can find that sermon archived there. I'm going to be in James chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. James chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. My dad made me read this passage a lot growing up. Anytime I got started getting an attitude or I was pretty, I was pretty compliant, right? I was, it was okay. I, I didn't have too much of a rebellious streak in me. I liked to listen and do the right thing for the most part. And so, but there was the occasion when the flesh guy came out and my parents sent me straight to James 3. The rod of correction and the word of God. Come on, somebody. James 3. That's another sermon. James 3. When you have it, just wave at me. James 3. If not, it's on the screen behind me. James 3, verses 3 through 12. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I want to speak to you from this subject this morning. Talking takes you places. Talking takes you places. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that if you don't mind. Talking, I hope you picked a good neighbor this morning. Takes you because we're going to be using our mouths some this morning. Talking takes you places. It takes you places. They may be places that you want to go or they may be places that you're not wanting to go, but talking takes you places. Now, the book of James functions within the New Testament, 27 letters, epistles, gospels in the New Testament, 39 books, prophetic and otherwise, Torah, law, wisdom, literature in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs functions as kind of the piece of wisdom within the whole canon of the Old Testament scripture as the place you would look to find kind of that practical day-to-day -day wisdom for living. If you're wondering about how you should live in these times, what you should say, what you should do, crack open your Bible to the book of Proverbs. I actually know uh, a law firm where, where the owner of that firm is a strong believer, and he's based all of his principles for his legal practice on the book of Proverbs. 
they are exploding. They just got like number one ratings in the region over on the East Coast. They are exploding with talent, and everybody wants to work from him. And, you know, he doesn't have to overtly say in this secular field, oh, by the way, this is the book of Proverbs. He's just living it and applying it. James functions for the New Testament like Proverbs does for the Old Testament. It's like the Proverbs of the New Testament. There are very many what would be called pithy or short, terse, punchy statements in the book of Proverbs, in the book of James, excuse me, that help readers who, this is James writing to believers spread out all around the known world outside, mostly outside of Jerusalem. He's writing as one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church to all the churches and believers around the Mediterranean Sea scattered abroad. And this is supposed to help them bridge the gap between their theology mentally and philosophically and practical lived theology. Because there can be a difference. We can think we have the right theology here and think we have the right understanding here, but somehow in our lives there's not agreement between that and what we're living. That's what we would call hypocrisy. When there is a sense of something being double. There's, there's one understanding here, but we're living as though this is the understanding. James is particularly concerned with the connection between speech or what we do with our tongue, talking to other people, how we present ourselves, how we talk to other people, and wisdom, holiness, and godliness. He sees the two as integrally connected, not divorced from one another, but forged together. One reveals the truths about another. So James writes and opens his epistle with this in James chapter 1, verse 16. Be slow to speak. He starts it off right from the get-go and says, even how you approach conversations and what you say in conversations reveals what you truly believe about God. Be slow to speak. By verse 26, that's actually verse 19. By verse 26, he, he gets in and says this, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. That's very confronting. <laughs> That's very abrasive. James would probably not do too well in today's culture. He probably wouldn't have thousands upon thousands beating down the door to hear him say, your, your religion is worthless, and you've actually faked yourself out. But this is exactly what James says. I had a conversation with a leader within the past couple years, and this leader had the proclivity and the habit of saying things that were just inappropriate. He, he had this issue of, of talking negatively about people and these throwaway comments and, and really being aggressive toward people who didn't agree with him. Demeaning them, making them feel bad. Now this person is elevated in, in leadership and had a conversation. Said, well that's just how I am. That's who I am. I said, I'm sorry you feel that way. The Bible strongly disagrees with that premise. I said, James actually has something to say about that. Out of the depths of who you are in your heart, your mouth speaks. Do not be deceived. That might be how your unsanctified fleshly self is, but you've been born again. The Spirit of God lives inside of you, and he holds the reins and the bridle to that mouth. My mouth, your mouth, all of our mouths, and that doesn't work. You can't say that. Well, that's just how I am. Jesus disagrees as well and says, the good person out of the good treasure of their heart brings forth good things. The bad person out of the bad treasure in their heart brings forth bad things. The heart is, is connected intricately what's inside to what is spoken outwardly. So for... for our, our, this is going to be a word, I'm telling you. Just prepare you. I hope, I hope we all have steel toe boots on today because the Holy Spirit's been talking to me all week. So I'm not telling you something he's not already been talking to me about. 
I'm just giving you some of the overflow here. We cannot use our personalities and our habits and, and how, how, how we just feel like, well, I've been that way my whole life. People know I, that's just how I talk. That's just how I am. We cannot use that excuse with God. He's interested in holding the reins and aligning our hearts and our mouth. Now, this text is primarily located in the context of James talking to spiritual leaders and teachers. Because everybody around the world wanted to be a leader and a teacher. They all wanted the microphone. They all wanted to talk. They, except you understand that's anachronistic. There weren't microphones in first century A.D., so you understand. They all wanted the spotlight. They all wanted the, the recognition. They wanted to teach people. Nobody was wanting to be taught. They wanted to teach people. And there had been this pandemic going around the Mediterranean Sea about divisiveness and speaking poorly of each other and trying to tear each other down to get elevated into positions of authority to be the teachers. And James locates this text in James chapter 3 and begins by saying not many of you should be teachers. So it starts with this understanding of being a teacher, preacher, leader, a guide to people's spiritual lives, but it moves beyond that into the generalities of every believer. So this is not for those of you today who, who read verses 1 and 2 and said, that doesn't apply to me. James actually makes this shift where he starts talking not just to teachers, but to everybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus. So we're, we're all on the hot seat today. We're all being addressed by the Word of God today. Let me look again at verse 3. Because James begins to string together at least five or six analogies or metaphors of what the tongue is like, what it is compared to, and how that is instructive for us today. And I'm going to go ahead and warn you, I feel like preaching today. There's rarely a time where I don't feel like preaching, but sometimes there's just this unction by the Holy Spirit where you shift into a, out of a, some more teaching and into preaching. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Write this down. The tongue needs discipline. The tongue needs discipline. Oh, how we despise discipline as a culture. How we despise correction. How we despise somebody even out of love saying there's a better way. Can you imagine the, the individuals that we read of in, in the New Testament? I think of particularly Priscilla and Aquila who are taken aside and shown more accurately their teaching. They had all kinds of teaching gifts, but they had to be brought aside and said, you don't know everything. Today, Priscilla and Aquila probably would have um, revenge tweeted the church in Jerusalem tried to get as many people as they could with them, broke off and planted their own church. But Priscilla and Aquila were mature enough to take correction and to receive it and to actually grow from it. The tongue needs correction and discipline. And James kind of really serves this up on a platter with this metaphor of horses. Because they weren't, they weren't driving Toyotas in first century A.D. Palestine and around the Mediterranean Sea. A horse was kind of the pinnacle of transportation. And so they would understand either they had seen this in action or experienced this before. And it was really, I love how James brings this home through this metaphor. A, a horse has a bit or a bridle with reins so that the pilot can steer. There's a discipline that's required that's not fun. How else? It, it's kind of, it, it hurts a little bit. How else do you get a 900-pound animal going 40 miles an hour to change direction. It's got to hurt a little bit to get them to shift. The bit in the bridle is not intended to be a form of animal cruelty. If the rider does not know how to wield the bit in the bridle, it can severely damage the horse. Oh, but the Holy Spirit is a trained instructor. He is a counselor and a helper. 
And his discipline and correction never harms our tongue and our mouth. It only brings help and correction. He is gentle and loving and kind when he corrects. He does not just take the reins and yank it and slice our tongue up and hurt our mouth and and break open the teeth like these bits and bridles had the potential to do. No, he, he steers and guides, but because he understands and he loves us too much to leave us to our own devices and our own speech, he said, no, 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 I need to correct that. I need to help you. Now, I guess it would be, I lose track of time now because it's just time is moving so quickly. I guess it would be 18 years ago at this point. I had this device. uh, I had pretty significant orthodontic work. And I had this device called a Herbst appliance. Okay? And they would cement on your back molars, top and bottom, these brackets with these arms that correct a crossbite and an overbite. And then I had the palate extender where you crank the key until it basically extends your palate. I had a great time, folks. It's like, can I just do dentures? Like, I just, I'm so done with this. So it, it was about a year and two months that I wore this Herbst appliance. And, and it, oh, it was so painful and corrective. And I felt when I would wake up, and if I opened my mouth too wide, the arms would pop and lock. And it would, because it was trying to create this sensation where don't do that. It's a negative stimuli so that you don't do that anymore. So when that appliance was taken off, I realized, oh, wow, I've been trained. I've been told, that's, I, I've, I, none of us have ever had a bit or a bridle in our mouth. We're not a horse to be ridden. But what I can tell you is that that experience taught me something about what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, in our flesh, in our unsanctified self, we want to rear back and just let it fly and speak our mind and, and just tell people what we think of them and how we feel. But the Holy Spirit puts that appliance within us and says, oh, don't go too far. You'll regret that. You're going to harm them. You're going to harm yourself. This is going to come back on you. This is going to damage them. Don't do that. I love you too much to have you talking to people that way. The tongue needs discipline. Now this goes against everything that our society teaches us in the glorious U.S. of A. First Amendment freedom of speech. Come on, I am thankful for the freedom of speech. I praise God for the freedom of speech that we can gather here without fear of persecution, and talk about Scripture. But the freedom of speech in America does not override the kingdom of God and the principles of the kingdom. Just because you have the right or freedom to speak doesn't mean that we should. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we need to be bridled. We need to have the bit in our mouth. We need to let the Holy Spirit rein it in. How much better would your life be right now if you wouldn't have posted that five years ago? Your employer may not be calling you in one month in and saying, hey, I found this. What happened there? How much better if you wouldn't have texted that person that or said that to them or spoke to them about that? Because honestly, it it probably wouldn't have made a difference if we just didn't say anything. Be slow to speak. My Sometimes in our individualized society and world, we think that our opinion is the single most important opinion in the whole world and that everybody else's is just garbage. Doesn't matter how they receive it. Doesn't matter how they feel. Doesn't matter. It's my right. I can say what I want. However they feel about it, it's how they feel about it. That's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. You are a citizen of heaven. I thank God for my U.S. passport and U.S. citizenship. I wouldn't want to live in another country more than I want to live in the United States of America. I feel called to this nation. I thank God for it. There's going to be awakening and revival in this nation as there hasn't been in hundreds of years. And I believe in it. But it's got to start. Discipline starts in the house of the Lord. Stop posting that. Stop talking to people that way. And stop treating people that way. Let the Lord take the reins. Let him tug gently. Let him lead and guide. Let him discipline. I never said that discipline was fun, but it's helpful. Oh, it's helpful. 
it pays great dividends. In the, I look back over my life, and there are so many things I'm thankful that I did not say. In the moment, there's nothing more that I wanted to say. There was a situation about a year and a half ago where I really wanted to just defend myself because I'm, I'm a debater by nature. My wife is our children's director, and she's in the children's ministry today, or she would stand and, and shout amen that I debate. I, I'm a debater. I like discussion, and I like, I like that. And I've had to learn not to like that as much because the Lord has taken the bridle, and he's tugged. And he's moved. There was a situation about a year and a half ago where somebody had made an unfair statement about me. Okay? And my knee-jerk reaction was to absolutely shred their argument and embarrass them for saying that about me. Can we just be honest? Can we put aside the pretense? And the Lord grabbed the reins And he restrained my tongue and said, do not defend yourself. I am your defender. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And in that moment, with every fiber in my being, I crucified the flesh. And I bit a hole through my tongue. (laughs) Oh, and the Lord disciplined me in that moment. Not, Not out of anger, out of love. And just pull back, pull back. Course correct. Move, move, move. Thanks be to God. Over the last year and a half, I've seen the Lord resolve that, salute, that situation, bring a solution. Didn't have to lift a finger, didn't have to say a word. He's our defender. Let him discipline our mouths today. It's not just that he says we're like a horse with a bridle. James offers another metaphor in verses 4 and 5. Let me read this. Look, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Hallelujah. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Write this down. The tongue steers direction. The tongue steers direction. When you think about ships today, they're quite different than ships in the ancient world. Regardless, both have rudders. And in the ancient world, in the ancient seas, in the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, all of these seas that hopefully we all learned in geography. Some of y'all are Googling that right now. That's okay. In New Testament introduction in my uh, Bible college, we had to spell all of them correctly or we missed it. As well, So it wasn't just enough to get them correct. We had to spell them correctly, which was a blast memorizing all the spelling. So there, there was this sense of guiding. When you think of this ship carrying people, you think of the sails, you think of the wind, you think of the currents, you think of all the factors, you think of the weight, the displacement of weight on the ship, and yet it is none of those things that James says steers it. And he is correct. For all of our nautical engineers in the audience today, he is correct. It is that small, tiny rudder that steers the direction. Without the rudder, the ship becomes uncontrollable, and it becomes tossed and turned in the sea by the circumstances of its environment. Church, I'm telling you today, there are people who are being tossed and turned in the vitriol, hatred, and venomous speech of today's world, and they've lost the rudder of the Spirit that is guiding them, and and their speech is directing them toward. I have seen faithful men and women of God who've loved God and lived for Him for 35, 40 years lose all of their credibility, their reputation over the last two years. Lost everything because their tongue was directing, their speech was directing them in not in the straight and narrow path, but in the wide path that leads toward destruction. You might feel real good. I heard one preacher say, oh, I know I shouldn't have said that, but it just felt real good to say it. That's ungodly. I know it might get some laughs in the audience, but that's not spirit-led living. It's not just spirit-led living. It's not just, ooh, I feel like I have a prophetic word I need to give somebody. It's about I probably shouldn't laugh at that. I probably shouldn't entertain that conversation. I probably shouldn't respond to that comment. 
Oh, the Spirit is, is guiding the rudder. Tiffany and I were on a cruise ship, this massive cruise ship. We were blessed with a cruise that we won at this event. And we were on the cruise ship, and, and as we're getting on board, I'm looking at the back, and I'm like, oh, that is a tiny, seemingly tiny little propeller in proportion to the ship, <laughs> right? You've got this massive, you know, 14, 16 floor level ship, huge. I mean, it would dwarf the Titanic, okay? And then you have this rudder. I mean, it's big, but in proportion to the ship, it's very small. It's very small. And yet it, in the wind, in the waves, when, when the wind is trying to take the sails of the ship, when, when the waves and the current is trying to push the ship in another direction, the rudder keeps it on course. The rudder keeps it going. In a culture where everybody is encouraging you to say whatever, do whatever, let that out, who cares? You need to share your opinion because nobody else is. You need to do this, post that, act that way. The Holy Spirit is taking the rudder and he's saying, no, 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 fight the current, fight the winds, go this way. The tongue steers the direction of your life. Oh, you're a product of yieldedness to what the Holy Spirit wants you to say. Our words can take us right where we need to be. Talking takes us places. Remember, that's the title of my message today. Talking takes us places. And the tongue is intended to steer us right where God is want, wants us to be. Now, let me perhaps bring correction to some ideology and theology that I would consider not necessarily uh, biblical in the sense that it's not borne out this way in Scripture, which I'm not saying the tongue is supposed to be in opposite day. For example, if you break your leg and you come up for prayer, you do not have to say, my leg is not broken. You need to say, my leg is broken and I need Jesus to heal it. There's a difference between allowing the tongue to steer you into holiness and righteousness and just flat out opposite day or denial, right? There is a difference, folks. Now, I'm, I'm telling you today, I, I've, I've met some people who said that because they acknowledged a diagnosis that they've claimed that over their life and they've ruined their life because they said, no, 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 no. The woman with the issue of blood said, I've, I've taken up all the doctors, all the money. I've got this issue, but i got to get to Jesus. He's the one who can make it better. The tongue steers the direction. It's not about denying the situations and pain and circumstances on our life. It's saying Jesus is the solution. He's the one who can fix it. He's the one who can make me better. I'm going to declare his word over this situation. Yes, in my body I might have cancer, but I'm going to declare the word over this cancer and declare that by his stripes, I am healed. It's not bad to admit the situation. It's bad when you allow the situation to define you and become your identity and not the word of God and the blood of Christ and its death, burial, resurrection, and ascension that can solve the issue at hand. The tongue steers the direction of our lives. It takes us places where we need to be. That's why we live by the word of God. Man shall not live. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is what Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 4 in his wilderness temptation by the devil. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Faith, Paul said to the church at Rome, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Okay, So there is a connection between our life and living according to the speech of God. Even all of creation responds to his speech. He said, let there be light. And since the moment he spoke it, light has been extending and expanding out throughout the, the universe. Never stopped. He never told it to, so it never did. Our lives are led and guided by his word, and I'm telling you that he looks at us today and says, in the same way your life is led and guided by your words, because the Lord says, I want to put my words in your mouth, and I want you to begin to speak them over your life, so that there can be a shifting in the course of the direction of your life. 
If all you do is join in with the cacophony of voices speaking negatively, speaking doubt, speaking uncertainty, speaking uh, depression, uh, you, you're going to find yourself in that place pretty soon. Well, I'm, I'm just in the worst rut. I just can't seem to get out. I'm just in a terrible place in my life. I just, I don't know, it's been this way for so long. I'm just so tired of it. I'm just, the Lord wants to put some new speech upon your tongue. I know that I've been going into the valley, but I thank you, God. God, that you're not just the God of the mountain, you're the God of the valley. And the same God who was with me in my greatest and best moments is the same God who's walking in the shadow of the valley of death. And I will not fear evil. I will not be afraid. Even though the storms of life come and seek to overwhelm me, God is my defender. He is my shield. He is my buckler. He is my strong tower. He is my defender. He has surrounded me. And, and even more, he put all of the angels around me to protect me and to guide me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. It doesn't matter how bad the situation that I'm finding myself. It's bad right now. But I thank God that you are with me. It's not bad to admit you're in a valley. It's bad when you don't admit God's with you there. Oh, he wants to comfort you in your lowest moments and comfort you in your greatest victories and your highest spiritual heights. The tongue steers the direction of your life. I've watched Exhibit A and my father, who was diagnosed with a rare arthritic disease at the age of 27, and the doctors expected him to die because of its crippling effects before he was 50 maybe even earlier, and there were several others in our community diagnosed at the same time he was diagnosed, and he said, this is tough. This is not the diagnosis that I wanted. This is not necessarily the life that I envisioned, but God has not gypped me. God has not forsaken me. God has opened doors, and my dad at 58 has more energy and life in him, and while most of those others have died who were diagnosed by the same point, he is living and probably could outwork most people in this room just out of his joy and out of his connectedness to what he sang and spoke over his life. Tongue steers the direction of your life. When I was growing up, my, my mom had a call and response with me. We did a call and response that Hayden led us in this morning. My mom had a call and response with me. Every morning of my whole life that I can remember, I mean, I, I, my memory's not perfect. I mean, there were probably things I don't remember when I was before five. But as long as I can remember, my mom would make this declaration over me when I was getting ready to go to school. She would go, Ben, are you ready? And I would say, yes. She said, okay, you're the head. And I would say, not the tail. She would say, you're the top. And I would say, not the bottom. She'd say, and you have the favor, and I'd say, of the Lord. Every morning, I spoke that over my life, and she spoke that over my life, and there is a reason that I turned out in, into the way that I did, and people ask, what, what was it? What did you do? How did you? I began to speak words of life that were spoken over me, and I just trusted God enough to start believing those words, according to Deuteronomy 28 through 30. I started believing those words over my life, and you know what? This thing works. <laughs> it works. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about silly goofiness. There's a difference. Oh, I just name and claim a, a Mercedes. Father, I thank you for that Mercedes. Now, now, the Lord likes to bless us with good things, but I'm talking about deeper things. The Lord wants to take us deeper than material things. I thank God for my house. It was a blessing from him. My car was a blessing from him. Tiffany's car was a blessing from him, and they're all amazing and nice, and I thank God for it. But life is more than houses and cars and all that kind of stuff. It's about Jesus, and it's about the things that shall never pass away, even though heaven and earth may pass away. His words never pass away. The tongue steers and guides the direction of our life. Talking takes you places. It takes you places. If you're not where you want to be, stick up the mirror today and say, what have I been speaking over my life? 
Have I been trusting in what God says over my life? Or have I been speaking some words over my life that would lead me into a pit of despair? Have I been believing what has been spoken over me? Oh, oh, talking takes you places. God has given us a gift that the smallest member, the tongue, can steer our whole bodies, can steer our whole lives. Let's not waste that gift. Let's use it today. He says something else in verses 5 through 8. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The tongue naturally, our our speech naturally, is destructive and deadly. Write that down. The tongue is destructive and deadly. It's destructive and deadly. Brings destruction and death. James shifts. He's been using these metaphors. This is what it's like. It's, It's like this. Okay. It's like a bridle in a horse's mouth. It's like a rudder on a ship. And he changes from metaphor to description. He says the tongue is a fire. He's no longer comparing, he's describing. The tongue is a fire. And he says it's set on fire by the flames of Gehenna, the Greek term for hell or this trash pile dump that was outside the the gates of Jerusalem where they would look and it's what Jesus likened hell to. And he said that trash dump that's burning full of garbage and fire, that's what set your tongue ablaze. Naturally. When it's not yielded to the Spirit. Think of all the harm, abuse, trauma, drama. Think about the wars. Think about all the things that have been caused by speech. Most things in your life are a result of speech. Either what you've said or what you've allowed to be spoken over your life. James says it's like a, like a fire. It's like a, a spark that starts a fire. Think of California. It's always one of the tops in, in, with regards to wildfires. And in 2021 alone, California has seen 8,367 fires that have burned over 3 million acres of land. 2021 alone. You know, most of those fires start with a spark. Something that seems insignificant or inconsequential. Over three million acres of land lost over something that seemed inconsequential or insignificant. The Lord with great love in his eyes looks at us today and says, Oh, don't let your tongue become a spark that causes wildfires in people's lives. There are words that have been spoken over you and over me. I can't speak for you. I'm sure this applies to you. But there are things that people have said to me that I can still recall if I think about it. I can still remember things that may have been hurtful, things that may have been painful. Now, that's been forgiven and covered under the blood, and those thoughts don't dictate my life. But I'm saying I could reach back into the recesses of my mind and pull things that somebody said in seventh grade or third grade or what a parent said at this point or an uncle said at that point. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? There are things that people have said and spoken that may have started a wildfire in your life in burned acres of land that God was calling you to conquer. Acres of time that he was calling you to redeem. And yet those words set ablaze something in you that deterred you from your calling, that moved you away from the confidence that you have in God or his plan for your life and set you on a path that led toward destruction for a season. But I thank God that what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn around for good. 
I thank God that those years that the locusts and the canker worms ate up, God can restore twofold and threefold and tenfold and fiftyfold and a hundredfold in our lives. We are not bound to the years that were lost because of someone else's words. In a moment, God can redeem it all. Oh, but these words cause great destruction. I think of the marriages. There are a lot of reasons that people would get divorced. And I thank God for grace and redemption, salvation. Hallelujah. He makes all things new. There's no condemnation in this house today. If you've been divorced, hallelujah. There is forgiveness and grace. The Lord restores and loves restoring. But I think through of probably when you talk about root causes, people might say that it was an affair, it was this, it was that. Normally it started with this. My spouse was not speaking words of life over me. They were only criticizing me. So I went to find affirmation somewhere else. You see? I felt every time I shared and opened my heart that every time I had a dream or something that excited me, they said, ah, maybe another time. They would not rejoice with me when I wanted to rejoice and speak joy in life. They would not mourn with me when I was mourning. They would not say, I'm here for you in your pain. And I'm not just going to try to offer some flippant, quick solution. I'm going to give you life-giving words even in your pain. See, it's not so much the end kind of flashbang grenade that goes off and ends the thing. It's normally the speech sown. It sows destruction. Nobody has to teach you how to speak poorly to other people. Oh, nobody has to. You don't have to go to a seminar on how to be rude, how to be short and curt with people. How to have an attitude or be sassy. I hear that all the time. Well, sassy and the spirit don't go together too well. And being sassy and just saying that's my personality, also Jesus wants to deal with that. Moving forward. I think of the destruction that's sown. You know what else? James says the tongue is full of poison. It's deadly. The thing about the tongue is this. When we speak and when we talk, what can happen is the tongue does not need a situation to make us frustrated, upset, or say something rude or mean or hurtful. It's like a black mamba. A black mamba is a snake that you do not have to irritate for it to strike you. It strikes without provocation. That means a black mamba could be sitting over there and I could be right here and that thing want to strike me and I'm not even doing anything. I'm not messing with it. I'm not. That's what the tongue is like. Jesus told the religious le- leaders, you, you brood of vipers. You, you pour out venom from your mouth. You speak words of death over people I'm speaking life to. Think of all the dreams that have been killed by somebody's speech. I think of all the world changers that have been silenced and believe that they're not worthy of that calling from God because of speech, because of what people have said. The tongue is destructive and brings death in situations. This is exactly what the serpent in the garden did. What did he do to deceive Adam and Eve? He didn't just look at them. He talked to them. And poured out, it wasn't the poison of the fruit that they ate of. It was the poison of his words that they bought and bit into that brought separation between us and God. The first poison that they ate of was not from the fruit, but from the serpent. Words bring destruction and death. Husbands, God is looking at you today, and he's surveying the way you've talked to your wife. The New Testament says that God stops listening to your prayers when you start treating your wife poorly. Your prayers aren't being answered because of the connection you're treating your spouse to because you're you're sowing death. You're supposed to be a covering. You're supposed to be a blessing. 
I'm talking to myself here. I'm a husband. Husbands, stop speaking to your wives that way. God is not pleased with venomous, vindictive comments that destroy their self-image, their self-worth, and their identity. They are beloved daughters of the Lord Jesus, and we cannot speak to God's daughters that way. Wives. (laughs) Stop talking to your husbands that way. Don't, don't, don't speak words of discouragement and death over them. Don't speak words of critique and criticism only. Speak life. Speak hope. Speak faith. Tell them that you're proud of them, that you want to see their success in God, that you're, you're seeing the steps that they're taking to fulfill their mandate to be a man of God and to be a father, not just to, to children and not just in the home, but in faith, that you see their efforts. If you want to see more of it, start affirming the small things that you see and what is affirmed will be developed and nurtured and grown start affirming and not just criticizing all the bad things because there's plenty of bad that we see in everybody's life but begin to speak words of life and encouragement friends don't talk to people that way if you want a friend be a friend (laughs) you look around your life and your circle and you say I don't have anybody in my life hold up the mirror Say, what have I been saying to people? What have I been doing? Nobody likes to be with a cynic and a critic. Well, that's just how I am. Well, the Lord doesn't want you to be that way. Nobody wants to be with somebody who's constantly criticizing and negative and pessimistic. I'm not saying you got to be a fake optimist. I'm just saying don't talk at all. (laughs) And you'll have like 100 friends. (laughs) You don't, you don't have to fake it until you make it and say something that's not true. Just, just hold back the criticism. It's, it's probably not going to change anything because you don't have relational capital maybe to even speak into that person's life. So just hold back. If you want to develop your circle of friends, hold back. They're probably not concerned about how you feel about that thing or this thing or that. They just, just be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. I told you this was applying to everybody. I'm looking at the mirror myself today and saying, oh, Lord Jesus, where where have you been highlighting that I've been deceived in my own life? I say this all the time, and I got to get this right. Deception is deceiving because it's deceptive. (laughs) If it wasn't deceiving, it wouldn't be deceptive. You buy into deception because you think you're doing the right thing and you're not. And so we have to hold up the mirror of God's word and say, what am I speaking? What am I saying? Let me, let me land here with one more thing in verses 9 through 12. The tongue requires discipline. The tongue steers direction. The tongue can cause destruction and death. But what is the solution? Somebody wave at me if you want to hear some good news. So, so, there might be some more bad news before there's good news. But I'm going to get to good, at least by the last paragraph of this message, there's going to be some good news about this situation and topic. But sometimes we just need to genuinely hear the truth and be confronted by the reality and not get like the quick fix pill. We need to see the severity of what's happening. Oh, if James, the half-brother of Jesus, would say something this significant to us, then it must be critically important for our life in God. Verses 9 through 12, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. I'm going to preach. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Say that with me. Ought not be so. Wow. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening? Here he goes back to metaphor. Both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree bear olives and a grapefruit, grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Write this down. The tongue cannot be duplicitous. I like that word, duplicitous. That just means double. It means double. Can't be duplicitous. The tongue cannot be double didn't sound as good. So I just used duplicitous instead. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Judy. I, I, actually, I actually included that just for you. She is our in-house grammarian, our expert, our resident expert. The tongue cannot be duplicitous. 
Church, there is the danger that you and I buy into a lie. That's the deception part. It's easy to look at the life of another person and say they're being a hypocrite. It's hard to stick up the mirror and say, I'm a hypocrite. That's why we spend time criticizing other people because we don't want to deal with our own issues and inadequacies. And we don't want to address the places where the Holy Spirit keeps touching. Saying, deal with that. Resolve that. So we like to look out and call everybody else a brood of vipers and hypocrites and everything else, but, but don't like to, to look in. So we, we come in, James, James would put it like this, we come in here and sing, and then we go out over lunch and slander. Talk about how terrible that person's hair looked or how wrinkled their clothes were or how, how you know what, they, man, they, they, they walked by me and, and just I feel like they looked at me the wrong way and I'm done with them. <laughs> yeah, this is real. This is, this is scripture right here. Let's just put it real for us for a moment and move out of the theologizing and philosophizing and let's just put it real right here. We sing and we say, oh God, you, you change us, you make us new, we're different, we thank you, we love you. Then we go out around the lunch table and we laugh at racist jokes. We crack sexist jokes at the expense of our brothers or sisters. That's not okay. It's not funny. Did you know that Jesus said every idle word or careless word that it's spoken will be held to account for? That's terrifying. Thank God that if we get under his forgiveness and under his blood, all that's forgiven. And it's not held against us. He doesn't take our words and weaponize them against us. He cleanses us and forgives us of things we've said. Folks, we can't go to connect group and share deeply about our lives and then speak poorly about people. Okay, we can't, we can't gather together in here and say, oh, I'm so happy you're part of our church family and then get in another group and say, "How? what are they doing here? James says, the tongue cannot be duplicitous. You, you can't do that. That's not okay. So we've got to stop laughing at that. We've got to stop telling that. We've got to stop saying those things. Because he said, it, it, it's like this. It's impossible for fresh water and salt water to coincide. Why? Because the moment that salt water is introduced, it becomes salt water. The thing that makes fresh water fresh water is that it doesn't have salt in it. <laughs> Don't drink salt water, folks. It's very, uh, yeah, unless you got some kind of scratchy throat and then gargle it with some hot water and salt and it'll help. So that's my medical advice. I hope I'm doing okay, all of the medical professionals up here. That's the only medical advice I'll give. Don't hold that against me. I will not be held legally responsible if you start choking on salt water, okay? Don't try to sue me. So... <laughs> So, so the, what makes fresh water no longer fresh water is the introduction of salt. So James would say it like this. If there's salt water pouring, it's not fresh water. So the two cannot cohabitate or exist together. Jesus put it like this. Out of the good treasure, you remember when I started, out of the good treasure of the heart, people speak and do good. Out of the evil treasure, evil places, they bring forth evil or bad. Folks, I think sometimes in this age of what's been kind of hyper grace movement where there's no standard of righteousness or holiness or godliness because we don't want to step into legalism, which I fully understand and say, amen, I don't want to live under the law of legalism. I want to live under the law of the Spirit. But the law of the Spirit is more strict than the 613 Old Testament laws. Jesus said, you've heard it said... Do not commit adultery. Jesus said, wait a minute, I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to take it up a step. Don't even look at a person with lust. Jesus said, you've heard it said, don't, don't murder. 
I say, don't, don't look at a person with the anger and vengeance in your heart. He takes it a step further. So the, the law of the Spirit is actually an intensification because it gets at motive, not just external purity, but internal purity. Jesus addresses the motive. So we say, that's just who I am. That's my personality. I just talk that way. I just say these things. I just do that way. That's just kind of how I was raised and, and deal with it, you know, whatever. The Spirit of God wants to come and visit us today. And you know what he does? You know what he did to Isaiah when, when God appeared to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? The first thing Isaiah realized is that his tongue was unclean. Behold, I am a man of unclean lips. The first thing he recognized when he got in the presence of Almighty God and the angels of heaven came down in this visitation, he said, oh no, my mouth has been messed up. So you know what God's solution was? To take a coal from the fiery altar of heaven and sear his mouth with it. How do we resolve and address a tongue that is set on fire by hell itself? James said, how do we address and deal with a tongue that is that perverse and destructive and deadly, full of venom, ready to strike without provocation to anyone at any time for any reason? We've got to fight fire with fire. Most of the time, you would think you would stop a fire by pouring water on it. Oh, but the tongue has to have a different fire placed upon it. That's why when the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost, there were sat upon them cloven tongues as of fire, indicating that there had been a purification and a language from heaven that was now going to come forth from them. God wants to fight the fires of hell in your mouth with the fires of heaven. He wants to take the coal from the altars of heaven and purge the wicked, ungodly, deadly, venomous tongue and set it ablaze with his love and his purity and his holiness and his righteousness. We cannot, church, I'm held accountable now. On the day of the judgment, the Lord Jesus is going to look at me and play back this sermon. Folks, I have the fear of God in me because as a teacher, I will be judged more strictly on what I'm teaching right now. So I teach you not out of condemnation or, man, he's really preaching at me. I'm preaching to myself. Oh, God, take the coal from the altar and sear my mouth with it so that no unclean, duplicitous thing. I don't want salt water and fresh water. I don't want two streams flowing. I don't want to be hypocritical anymore. I don't want to act this way and talk this way in front of this group and then act this way and talk this way in front of this group. I don't want to speak to people that way anymore. Take the coal from the altar. tongue cannot be too duplicitous. Here, you say, well, what, what do we do? I'm getting there. I'm almost there. Well, what is it that we do? What is the purpose then? The tongue of the believer is not meant to be venomous. It's not meant to cause fires in people's life. What you view maybe as a throwaway comment somebody can stew on for decades. What you thought was just some throwaway comment I remember one, one of my mentors said this one professor spoke to me and gave some throwaway comment, and it changed my life for the better. It changed my life. When he met me a decade later, he didn't even know who I was. He didn't even recognize me. He didn't even remember I was in his class. He gave me some throwaway comment, and it changed my life. The tongue has that power to do that. What is the tongue of a believer made for? Are you ready? Get your pencils, pens, and phones ready. <laughs> oh, the tongue of a believer is a mirror of the heart. You cannot see the state of your own heart. Listen to your words. That's what the state of your heart is. If you want to know how your heart is doing, listen to your mouth. Listen to what you're saying. Listen to how you're talking to people, how you talk about yourself. 
That's a mirror of the condition of your heart. But here's what the tongue of a believer is intended for. We're in a season of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Here's what the crescendo is that Paul writes. Give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what is the tongue of a believer supposed to do? It's supposed to give thanksgiving to God. That's what the tongue is intended to do. What else? It's intended for gentleness. According to Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. According to Ephesians 4, 15, the believer's tongue is intended for truthfulness truthfulness, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head that is Christ. According to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15, the believer's tongue is meant for praise. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Watch this. The fruit of of lips that openly profess his name. The believer's tongue is meant for prayer. If we ask, 1 John chapter 5, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that we have the requests that we have asked for. What is the believer's tongue for? It's for prayer. The believer's tongue is meant for spiritual gifts of the nine mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Five of them deal with the tongue. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. The believer's tongue is meant to communicate the mysteries of heaven in the earth. The believer's tongue is meant for thanksgiving, for praise unto God, for exhortation into the truth and love, for encouragement to brothers and sisters. Oh, God wants to use our speech, our our tongue, our mouth to take us places. He wants to take us into the good things that he's prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Church, stand with me. Only the Lord can do this miracle. I I can't do it. Oh, I I can't even do it in my own life for my own self. Only the Lord can take the coal from the heaven's altar and place it and sear. And only the Spirit of God holds the reins and restricts and guides and disciplines with love. Only His grace poured out upon us can take the vial of poison that lies underneath the tongue and exchanges it for honey. God wants your words to be healing oil that pour out into the earth. Healing words over your family and your friends. Oh, healing words in in times of resistance and confrontation. He wants you to have his words in season that pour out like honey into the earth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Only his love, only his fire can break the duplicity of our tongue where we say one thing and we say it in front of this group and then we act another way. There are two things that the Lord revealed to me as I was preparing that he wants to deal with today. The first is this. I I feel by the Spirit, the Lord actually spoke to me last night as I was praying through and preparing final preparations. The Lord spoke to me and said, there are some people who've been replaying words that have been spoken over their life. There are some words that have have a stronghold that are guiding, that are determining the course of where you're heading. The Lord says He wants to free people from those strongholds of what's been spoken over you. Lies, untruths, things that you have bought into. Maybe you don't, you're not even aware right now until I'm saying it that maybe there are some things that, oh, that's me. I've, I've been buying into this. The Lord wants to free you. The Lord wants to free you. Can all of you just close your eyes in this moment, not out of shame or nervousness or anything, just focusing on the Lord. You're going to be the one, and I'm going to be the one standing before Jesus giving account for what we've said, not the people standing around. They have to give account for themselves. Let's allow the searching gaze of the Lord to come upon our hearts 
and look within. If you would say, that's me, I've got, I've, I've had a word. It's, I even feel that it's, it's been like a curse over you. You felt as though it's been like something that keeps coming up in every single instance of your life when you feel like you finally made momentum and you feel like you finally went in the right direction. Can you just lift your hand quickly if, if you feel that? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Now just open your hands out in front of you, those of you with your hands lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus, I break every word curse that has been spoken over the lives of these people. By the authority of Jesus Christ, we tear down every stronghold that would exalt itself above the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We break every demonic attack that has been sent on assignment through the venomous tongue, through the destructive tongue. We break it in the name of Jesus. You will not fulfill I feel the Lord saying, you will not fulfill that word curse. You're going a different direction. You don't have to be afraid. That's not true over you. That's not who you are. That's not where you're headed. God has saved you. He has redeemed you. He has made you new. Those words and the authority of those words have lost their power over you in the name of Jesus. Every word curse broken in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you that you're speaking new words over these who were honest and said, yeah, that's me. I'm buying into a lie. Thank you that you're saying that they're loved. Oh, that they've got incredible things that they're going to walk into and do for the kingdom of God. I thank you that they don't have to worry about, I, I just sense strongly there are some of you who feel like extreme inadequacies where you feel like, oh, I, I'm just, I, I don't know how that could be me. E even even like a Moses who would say, you've got the wrong person. Father, I thank you that they're the right person. You have chosen them. You have ordained them. You have called them before the foundation of the earth. Father, heal. Let your words over them right now be like healing oil into the wounds of word curses and negative, violent, abusive speech over their life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, there are others here today who would fit into a different category and I felt this strongly too that you say I, I, I've got I've got I've got to have heaven's coal placed upon my mouth I've got to move into not free speech holy speech sacred speech sanctified speech pure and undefiled speech I've got to move into it I've got to grow into it. And the Lord wants to come and visit you today just as he did Isaiah with the coal of the altar. If that's you and you say, I'm, I'm ready for holy speech. I'm, I'm ready to be tamed by the Spirit of God. I'm ready to give him the reins. Lift your hand up long enough and high enough for me to see it. Yep, yep, yep. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that right now there's being a transaction the places where we've held the reins on our what we say and what, how we treat people, Father, I thank you that we are handing those reins over to you right now. We are handing the reins. I thank you that lordship means that we don't get to decide when it's appropriate and when it's not and what is appropriate and what is not. Father, I thank you that all those decisions are off our back now and they're on you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. And you get to make those decisions for us. Father, thank you that you are holding the reins, you, but, but that you're not violent. Today, you don't come and say you're the worst ever. can't believe you would call yourself this. You don't condemn. With love in your eyes, you say, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. I have the reins now. And, and, and the Lord Jesus, through the person of the Holy Spirit, is so gentle. He's not coming to to just take the reins and yank and jerk and, 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 and damage you. He's coming to heal you and take you in the direction of His purpose and plan. So Father, I thank you that you're taking people right into your plan through what you're even going to begin to speak through them and lead them to speak over themselves and their family and their friends. Father, I pray right now that the coals upon the altar from heaven would come and we would feel 
the fiery tongues from heaven fill our mouth and that no longer, Holy Spirit, when we want to say that or joke about that or do that or or make comment on that, Father, I thank you even now that for some of you, you're even going to get a, a almost like a burning sensation when you feel like you want to say something that you know that God isn't wanting you to say. Father, I thank you that for some, they're even going to have that radical of an experience where they're going to begin to feel the fires of heaven's coals. Father, thank you. Thank you that all things are made new. You make all things new. It doesn't matter what we said, the speech we used before we came in here to this moment. Now when we cry out for your forgiveness and cleansing, it's under your blood. It's forgiven. It's over. And we walk out of here walking into the good words that you want to speak through us and over us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just begin right now, for those of you who fell into the, either of those categories, just begin with your mouth out loud, because it's not enough just to think it, you've got to speak it, you've got to say stuff out loud, you've got to read the word out loud, you've got to pray out loud, not just in your head, it's okay sometimes, but you've got to speak these things, over. just begin with your mouth, remember, our, the, the tongue of a believer is meant for the praise, giving it the fruit of the lips, just begin to offer praise and thanksgiving to God, Father, thank you right now, just, just tell them you're great for for fixing and and exchanging the venom for honey. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and touching and healing and making new. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making right every wrong place. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing. Oh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice before I conclude with benediction, I just I want to provide space. If there's anybody who's here who said, yeah, I feel the tug of the Lord on my heart to give my life to Him. It's not just about this speech thing. It's every area. And maybe some of you came in here today and you didn't know the Lord Jesus or, or you thought maybe you did, but, but there wasn't a genuine, true confession of faith and His Lordship over your life and you didn't really give your life to Him. And today you say, I really want to surrender my life to Him and give Him everything. Not just just as Savior, but also as Lord, calling the shots and making the decisions. If that's you and you say, I feel in my life right now the tug of the Lord to give my life to Him, to be saved and changed. If that's you, can you just lift up your hand? I want to pray with you. Yeah, yeah, yes. Here's the beautiful thing. Here's the beautiful thing about the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that if we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, we will be saved. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if that was you and you raised your hand, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to pray a prayer and everybody can join me. It's not about getting the words exactly right. It's about your heart behind it, that you're giving your life to Jesus and you're trusting your whole life to Him. So so those of you who raised your hands and those of you who didn't, who want to pray this prayer out loud, I invite you to just, you can repeat after me. You can say exactly what I say, or you can say it in your own words. But but I'll give space after I say a line for you to repeat. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you were buried for me. Thank you that you raised a life for me. Thank you that you ascended to the right hand of God for me. Thank you that you're praying for me. I believe you're the Son of God. And today, I receive your death on the cross. I receive your burial in the tomb. And I receive the power of your resurrection. I give my life to you. I entrust my whole life to you. I give every space of my heart to you. I surrender everything to you. I give you everything. And I receive you as Lord. I receive you as Master. I receive you as Savior. All things are washed away now. 
all the old things are forgiven. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. And I am made new today. I'm a new creature. I'm in the family of God. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am loved. I am accepted. I am new today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Can we just give a hand to all those? Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we're made new in your presence. We're made new. Now, all of you who would, just extend your hands out in front of you. The Lord gives pastoral leaders authority in the Scripture to pray prayers and speak words of blessing over you. That's why I never take for granted this moment of benediction. It's not a conclusion. It's a blessing over your life and your family. I am speaking right now on behalf of the Lord over you. The Lord is wanting to speak through me words of blessing over you this week. So, Father, I I bless you, church, in the name of God the Father. I bless you in the name of God the Son. And I bless you in the name of God, the Holy Spirit. I bless your week to be filled with the great mercy and love of the Lord God. Oh, that His mercy would pour over you this week. When you wake up, when you go to bed, when you're at work, through your day, you would feel like a pulsing sensation through your whole body. His mercy and love being poured out upon you like waves breaking over your life of His mercy and His grace that wherever you go, like the psalmist said in Psalm 23, His mercy and goodness will follow you all the days of His life. And all the days of your life, His mercy and goodness are chasing after you. They're pursuing you. Oh, even when you felt as though you were far from Him, His mercy and love and grace was chasing you down, hunting you down. And in the same way, it's going to chase after you this week. I bless you with that realization. Church, I bless your mouth this week to pour forth the honey of heaven. Honey of heaven. That upon your tongue, people will begin to ask for your advice, your wisdom, your counsel. And even for some of you in conflict resolution situations, that you're going to have in-season, graceful, and loving word that's going to bring healing and reconciliation. I bless your homes to be filled with those words. Words of life, faith, hope, and love. Words that edify and do not tear down. Words that bring life and not death. I bless your hands and feet as you go out of this place to carry that which has been imparted into you today through the ministry of the Lord Jesus and the personal Holy Spirit. That same thing that you have received today, the Lord looks at you and says, I'm blessing you to freely give that away to everybody you come in contact with. So today I want to conclude with this prayer from Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word, this is the blessing today, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.